Welcome everyone to Toward Today Ministries and our continuing series called The Hebrew Key, where we look into some detail of the Hebrew language or Hebrew word, uh, something unique that doesn't uh, just come right to the surface in our English translations. Uh, now, some of these Hebrew key teachings are easier to follow and um, some are not so easy to follow. This is one of those where you need to really follow along closely, uh, put on your thinking kippah, and uh, we're going to dig down a little bit. And this all arises out of a word that came up in last week's Torah portion, Torah portion Noach, and the building of the Tower of Babel. And so we're going to look at a word uh, called, it's chamar, and uh, we're going to find some, I hope, some fascinating, interesting things that tell us about our relationship with Messiah and with one another. So follow along, and uh, if you get stuck, stop the tape and back up and or listen to it a second time. And it's not that difficult, but you will have to think and pay close attention as we go. All right, let's begin. Here's our Hebrew word. It's the word chamar, which is a verb, and it means to heap up. You make a pile of something that is to chamar. Now, most Hebrew words or Hebrew verbs can also be used as nouns, as we're going to see in just a moment. <clears throat> so uh, even the word heap in English can be a verb. I am, uh, I, I am heaping up something. And then after I'm done, I have a noun, a heap of something. So to heap is a verb and a heap is a noun. So this word works much the same way. So let's take a look at an example of a heap of something. Uh, Exodus 8, 13 and 14. Uh, we're looking at one of the plagues that the Egyptians experienced. And it says, uh, and, and God sent this plague of frogs. And when the frogs died, it says, And Adonai did according to the word of Moses. The frogs died out in the houses and courtyards and the fields. And they heaped them together in heaps, and the land stank. Can you even imagine what that smelled like? And there you see our word chamar, and there again. And this uh, phrase, heap them together into heaps, is chamarim chamarim. And it's, uh, they heaped heaped. <laughs> That's kind of how it comes across in Hebrew. So there were multiple double heaps of dead frogs. So there you can see how the word is used. Now, here's another interesting use of this word. Uh, Psalm 46.3, it says, Though the waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling. How can you have a heap of water? Well, that's the word that's used, the word kamar. And what it's talking about is that the waves would come up and they would, in some translations, it says that the waters would heap up. They become a mound. It doesn't last very long and then they go back. But these large waves are also called uh, by the word chamar, to heap up. Let's look at another example. In Leviticus 27, 16, it says, If a man dedicates to Adonai part of the land that is his possession, then the valuation shall be in proportion to its seed. A homer, homer of barley. Your English translation may just say omer without the H or the CH on the front, but it's the same word. Now, this is the noun form. Chamar means to heap up. A homer is a heap. And so it says he may bring a homer of barley seed that shall be valued at 50 shekels of silver. Um, you may be familiar with counting the omer between Passover and Shavuot. That's the same word. So why is this dry measure of grain called a chomer, a heap? Uh, because in this basket, in this measure, you would have a heap of, in this case, uh, barley, or you could have wheat or, or have fruit or whatever else. We use the term bushel. I don't know the etymology of the word bushel. But uh, over time in Israel, a heap of grain was considered to be a certain amount, and they made a, a homer basket 
to hold a homer of wheat or barley or whatever. Now here's a really interesting application of this word. It's the word donkey, which is not spelled exactly the same. The word for donkey is chomar. There's an extra letter added in, but it still comes from this root word. So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his chomar, his donkey, and took two of his young men with him and so on. Why would a donkey be called after a heap? Well, you have to think of a donkey as a first century or, or ancient world pickup truck because you could heap a lot of stuff onto a donkey. A, a donkey is incredibly strong and it can carry, in addition to its own weight, it can carry its own weight again and, and plus a lot more. They're incredibly strong animals and they would heap a lot of bundles and, and uh, packages of things on top of the donkey. And like I said, it was an ancient world pickup truck. Okay, so we get some examples of how this word is used, but uh, let's look at the very first place the word is used in the Torah. And the very first place it's used is in Genesis 11:3, from the account of the Tower of Babel. It says, And they said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and bitumen for mortar. Now, I could have also put the word bitumen. I'm not sure if it's bitumen or bitumen. You have to check me on the pronunciation. But that basically is also the same word here, which is the word homer. homer. And uh, why would the word for the mortar, which is the, this tar stuff they use, why would it also share the same word as, as heap and uh, foaming waves and donkey? What, what's being piled up here? When you think about it, it makes perfect sense. If they wanted these bricks to stick together, they had to use a mortar so they could heap the bricks together into a structure, into a tower. So the material they used is called homer because it helps them create a large, organized, architecturally sound heap. So let's summarize a bit. This word, when it's pronounced homer, can mean heap, foam, or a wave of water, a donkey, an omer basket uh, that holds a heap of grain. It can mean tar, and it can mean mortar. Now here's the interesting thing where it suddenly takes a curve. If you pronounce this word hammer like this, it means wine. What in the world does this word have to do with wine? It could be it takes a heap of grapes to make a, a sizable amount of wine. That's a bit of a stretch. But why would wine be called by the same word? Now, the spelling stays the same, kep, mem, and resh. Just the pronunciation changes. Instead of chomer, you've got chemer. What is God trying to teach us here? You know, I believe Hebrew is more than just uh, another language. I agree with the rabbis that say it's the language of transcendence. It's the heavenly tongue. It is the language that is extraterrestrial, it's not of this world. And it has layer upon layer upon layer of meaning and insight as it's used in the scriptures. And so in the very first place, we find this word that is under investigation here. It is in reference to mortar used to basically glue clay bricks together. And this word can also mean wine. Let's find an example of where it means wine. Here's one in Deuteronomy 32, 14. Curds from the herd and milk from the flock with fat of lambs, rams of Bashan and goats with the very finest of the wheat. And you drank foaming hemmer. There it is, wine made from the blood of the grape. 
So here in the Torah, where we find this, and I believe this is the first time it means wine, that it's pronounced chemer, it's connected with blood. Now, figuratively, but the blood of the grape. You know, Yeshua, at that last Passover Seder, he poured wine, chemer, and he offered to them, and he says, this is my blood of the new covenant. Now, you might accuse me of reading more into this than there is, but I don't think so. I, I think this is something God is hinting at and speaking to us here. You know, over in, in 1 Peter, we are called living stones, living stones. Unlike the Tower of Babel, it was just made out of dead clay, out of dirt that had been fired in a kiln and turned into bricks and then glued together with homer, with tar. We are living stones. We too need to be glued together. But what glues us together? I believe it's the hammer, the wine, which is the blood of Messiah. And you know, the life is in the blood. And it's the life of Messiah that serves as mortar for the living stones. After all, if you have living stones, wouldn't you need living mortar to hold them together? This is the passage. Oh yes, and I can't forget Isaiah 27 too. In that day, a vineyard of pure hammer. Sing of it. I guess that's a little bit what we're doing today. Singing of this living wine the blood of Messiah. But 1 Peter 2, verses 4 and 5 state, As you come to him, a living stone, rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Yeshua the Messiah. So again, if stones made of clay, of brick, need to be glued together with a mortar that comes out of the ground, shouldn't living stones be glued together with a living mortar? And so when you think of stones being mortared together, there's something that separates them but connects them. The purpose of the mortar is to connect them. And what connects you to me is the life of Messiah. The life is in the blood. It's the blood of the Messiah, the life of Messiah that connects us together. And when we try to connect together in a spiritually intimate way without the life of Messiah, it doesn't work well. So everything around us, above and below, everything that connects us together should be the life of Messiah, living life in the context of his life. And I think as living stones, if we want to be built up into this, this, spiritual, um, this spiritual house, we need to be completely immersed in the life of Messiah. So, all of that out of one word, but welcome to the world of Hebrew. And I hope this has been a blessing to you. And I'm not going to try to finish all the thoughts that uh, can spring out of this teaching, but I hope I can be a springboard for you to continue to meditate on this and think about it. Then ask yourself, am I a living stone? And I, do I share the life of Messiah with those around me? So anyways, I, uh, I leave the rest of this with you to think about. And until next time, I wish you shalom and may God bless. See you next time.